Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us today for our webinar titled Making Meaning of Scores. Today, we're going to discuss the variety of scores that you can calculate for the Woodcock Johnson family of assessments, including the WJ, the Bateria, and the Woodcock Munoz Language Survey. Uh, my name is Beth. And I'm a school psychologist and licensed educational psychologist in the state of California. Uh, I was born and raised in Alaska and did my undergraduate program there. And I've worked as a school psychologist in Alaska, Washington, and California. One of my passions has always been trying to make some of this more conceptual psychometric information more easily understandable by everybody that uses it. We're going to spend a second talking about standardized assessment because we can't get scores that we can trust and interpret if we aren't doing standardized assessment in a way that uh, leads to scores that we have faith in. So we're going to talk about that briefly and then we're going to dig into a little bit different types of scores and I'm going to warn you, you see this is a long agenda, we're not going to get to all of this today, likely. I'm going to go through as much as we can. We're going to have people kind of monitoring the chat and seeing questions that come in. I've included all of this information in your handouts. So the slides that I would give about all of these different sections are in the handouts. So you can reference those for more information. And if you have follow-up questions, you can reach out to us. We're going to get through what we can get through in the next 51 minutes. And then if we need to schedule more sessions in the future, future or talk more, we can definitely do that. So let's talk about standardized assessment for just a moment. I know a lot of you are assessment professionals, so I'm not going to dig into this too deeply, but I do want to make sure that we have a shared foundation. So when we're talking about standardized assessment, what are we referring to? Well, a definition is any test in which the same test is given in the same manner to all test takers. That's a really broad definition. And when I think about that definition, it includes things like what? SAT, ACT, end of year assessments, anything that has a very strict administration protocol, it includes actually a lot of different assessment measures. For the purposes of our conversation today, we're gonna narrow that a little bit and we're gonna talk about individually administered standardized assessments, such as the Woodcock Johnson um, and other times when we're sitting one-on-one -on -one with a student to complete the assessment. Um, as throughout our conversation today, I'm going to probably use the WJ achievement as kind of a stand-in for talking about assessment more broadly. Please note that that's just kind of a vocabulary easy way to refer to one test. I'm really talking about the width and breadth of the WJ and the other tests that we have available. So standardized assessment is a way that we can compare our student to a national sample of their same age or sometimes same grade peers. We have very specific administration guidelines and it gives us an opportunity to see what a student is capable of under optimal conditions. The reasons that I complete a standardized assessment one-on-one -on -one with a student, which we'll talk about in a second, not with the rest of the classroom there, is because I'm really trying to give them the most quiet individual attention and motivation with breaks and rewards as we need to see what they're capable of. And then I wanna compare what I see in that setting with what we see in the classroom and see if there's a gap. And if there's a gap, we might've learned some things about the student's environment and how they respond to different contexts. I'm gonna sound a little bit repetitive here for the next couple of minutes, but I really want to underline that standardized assessment is only one piece of the puzzle. When we look at the federal regulations that guide special education assessment and the state regulations that um, give us further instruction, we see that really the intent of all of this legislation was to have a multi-source, multi-method evaluation that pulls from a lot of different parent report, teacher report, classroom data, grades, curriculum-based measurements, standardized assessment, all of these different sources. And this, the laws and regulations really doesn't hold one of those sources above the other. But somehow in practice, standardized assessment has been elevated as the most important thing. And then we do all those other things as ancillary. And that's really not the way it was designed. Standardized assessment is meant to be one piece of a comprehensive look at a child. So what is standardized assessment not? Well, it's not the best way to measure student performance in every situation and for every purpose. 
Specifically, it's not a sensitive measure of very specific skills. I was, as a school psychologist, I was in a meeting with a legal team once and they tried to corner me. They tried to say, I need to know what this WJ score says about how well she can do multiplication. And my response to them was, showing me her WJ score report actually says very little about how well she can do multiplication because you're asking the WJ a question it was not designed to answer. The WJ isn't designed to answer very specific narrow skills. It's meant to be a broad measure of ability. So I can tell you what her overall calculation ability is like compared to her same age skill, uh, peers. And if you gave me her uh, response book, I could look through and see how she engaged with the handful of multiplication items that she did. But don't criticize the WJ for not doing a good job of answering a question it wasn't designed to answer which is those very specific narrow skills. That's what curriculum-based measurement and other more narrow skill assessments are made for. The WJ is meant to be broad, um, both achievement, COG, all of them, broad ability sets. Standardized assessment is not the only way to determine special education eligibility, as I referenced before. And hopefully, especially after our time together today, it's not this useless number that no one really understands that we just talk about as little as possible. So I've referenced this, how do we do it? How do we do standardized assessment? Well, we have very specific administration guidelines. We're working one-on-one -on -one with the student in, here's a quote, a well-lit quiet room that is free from distractions and interruptions. That's kind of a dreamland, right? Who has one of those on a campus? On a good day, maybe. On a bad day, we're administering in a closet and hoping no one bursts in the door and interrupts us. But we can't have an, evaluation that we're confident in unless we know what best practice is and try and approximate it as close as possible. So we're going to get as close to this as we possibly can. We're going to establish and maintain rapport with the student, praising how hard they're working, not letting them know how many questions they're getting right. The feedback I'm going to give is, I can't wait to send you back to class and tell your teacher how hard you worked today, not, oh my goodness, you just got five right in a row. That's not what we're doing here. We're also giving them breaks and rewards as needed to keep them motivated and working, which is not possible if I start testing the day before my meeting. So we want to make sure we start evaluating as early as possible in the process so we really have time to do it right. And finally, when we talk about how we do it, we're taking care of testing security. These tests only work if the questions are not widely available uh, in the public. And so we have to be very careful to make sure that we are not leaving our tests unattended and not doing things like including test items in our evaluation reports uh, that open those up to anyone who reads the report. And finally, before we get into talking about scores, how do we use standardized assessment? Well, we're doing a statistical analysis of the students' current levels of performance. In reality, kind of practically, the main reason we use it is special education eligibility. There are some other sources, maybe research studies, gifted and talented entry, some English learner programs. So there, there are other resources but or other purposes, but I would guess that most of the people that are in this conversation today, we primarily use these assessments for eligibility. <clears throat> and last time I say it, I promise, we use it in conjunction with other sources of data. We pull together every other piece of information we have about this child and build a comprehensive view of them. I always tell people, you can hand me a WJ score report and I will know some things about this child. You give me a report that includes all the other information that you have about their attendance history, classroom data, interview data, curriculum-based measurement, grades, et cetera, I know so much more and I can really paint a picture of this child in their learning environments when I have that more comprehensive view of them. All right, let's talk about why we're actually here today, right? Making meaning of scores. How do we do this? Those of you that are trained diagnosticians or school psychologists, some of this might feel uh, a little bit of a review of the basics, but I hope that it will give you a good chance to kind of connect to what it is and how we're explaining these things. So this is the normal curve. This is a image that a lot of people are familiar with. It's called the normal curve, the bell curve, standard distribution. There, there's a lot of different names for it. What's interesting about this curve is that this is the shape of a lot of naturally occurring things in the world. 
So I'm lucky enough in my home workspace that I have a beautiful big tree right outside my window that you can't see, but it's right over here. And if I were to go out to this tree and pull every single leaf off the tree and measure it and draw a chart of the length of the leaves in inches, the chart would be this image almost identically. There would be a whole bunch of uh, leaves that are about the same size, right? The vast majority of the leaves would be very similar in size. I would have some leaves that are bigger, like kind of atypically large. I would have some leaves that are smaller, that are atypically small. Uh, but for the most part, the vast majority of them would be here in the middle. The exact same thing is true of human beings on cognitive, academic, and language abilities, pretty much every human ability. The vast majority of people at any age or grade range are similar to each other, statistically. There will be some that are above that and some that are below that. What a standard score tells us is where a individual's performance falls on this curve. So let me give you a little caveat here. Um, so when I was in grad school, training to be a school psychologist, I had a lot of different weird jobs. And one of the jobs that I had was collecting data on uh, for the then brand new PBS kids show, Sid the Science Kid. And I'm dating myself a little bit by saying Sid the Science Kid was brand, brand new. So the way that PBS says, oh, we made the show for preschoolers and it's educational is before the show comes out, they actually collect some data. So they send episodes of the show with a research assistant into a family's home with a, the parent and the young child. You watch the episode of the show together and then you do some activities with the child to see, okay, did they learn the concepts that they were supposed to learn from this episode of Sid the Science Kid in my case? Um, and if so, we can say, okay, this is an educational show. So I participated in this research study as one of the research assistants and collected data on a lot of children. And as a result of that, there was an episode of Sid the Science Kid that I watched over and over and over again. And it's actually turned out to really help me in these conversations. So I'm glad for it. At the time, it was a little intense. But this is an episode of Sid the Science Kid you might have seen. It's, called, it's about non-standard measurement. And non-standard measurement is one of those phrases where the definition is kind of in the word. It means engaging in measurement, measuring something when some sort of non-standard unit. So the example that I wanna show you is I'm gonna take my achievement examiner's manual and a Sharpie. And if I wanted to use non-standard measurement to measure my examiner's manual, I would say that my examiner's manual is almost exactly two Sharpies long. Now, this isn't a standard unit of measurement, right? Because there's little Sharpies, there's big Sharpies. I can't just call you up and say, hey, can you give me a piece of string that's two Sharpies long? And you wouldn't know exactly what that means. So that's non-standard measurement, right? Versus if I was to measure my examiner's manual in with a ruler and in inches and say it's 10 and three quarters inches long, that's standardized measurement because an inch is an inch is an inch, no matter where you are. So that's kind of the, the distinction there. Non-standard measurement means measuring in a non-standardized unit. So in this episode of Sid the Science Kid, something that happens is it shows this little vignette of a teacher and her students measuring the width of her classroom in the height of one of the students. So the student lays down on the ground with her feet up against the wall. The rest of the students mark where that student's head is. Then they get up and put their feet where their head was and lay back down. And they figure out that the length of their classroom is, I don't know, let's say six Johnnies long. A Johnny is a non-standard unit of measurement, right? Because that isn't a unified thing. So let's say that that teacher does that experience with her students. And she figures out that her classroom is six Johnnies long. Well, also what's happening in that teacher's life is she's applying for a job at a different school. And she goes to that school, she has an interview, she nails it. Like she really thinks this is gonna happen. The principal pulls her aside after the interview and says, you know what, that was awesome. I really hope we're gonna be able to have you join our team. If we are able to do that, I wanted to ask you a question though. We actually have a couple different classrooms that are available for next year. And I was wondering if you kind of had any preferences so that we could potentially earmark one for you if we're able to move forward. 
If that teacher looks the principal in the eye and says, you know what, in my current school, my classroom is six Johnnies long, and I'm really looking for a classroom that's like, I don't know, maybe seven and a half, I think that would work better for me. What's the principal's reaction going to be, right? They're going to be a little wide-eyed, maybe a little confused, because they're not speaking the same language. They're not speaking in a unit of measurement that has meaning to both of them. And this teacher might have just talked herself out of the job that she was hoping for. If, on the other hand, that teacher says, my old classroom was 20 feet wide, and that was not quite enough, I was really hoping for something a few feet longer, then we're having the same conversation, right? They understand each other, are speaking in the same unit, and can make meaning about what's being said. In the same way, remember I was measuring my examiner's manual in Sharpies. If I, as the school psychologist, come to our evaluation meeting and say, I measured this student's cognitive ability, and it is three and a half Sharpies long. And the special education teacher comes to the meeting and says, that's great, I measured their achievement ability and it's one and a half pens long. And your SLP comes in the room and says, guess what guys, I measured his uh, language ability and his language ability is three and a half highlighters long. We're not gonna be able to know what the student's strengths is, what the weaknesses are, what one compares to the other, because we're all speaking in different units of measurement. A standard score is not a magical number. It does nothing other than give us the same unit of measurement. So I do my assessment, the teacher does their assessment, the SLP does their assessment, and then we all convert our individual data into the same unit of measurement, into inches and feet, if we were measuring distance in distance in countries that use English. So um, if, if that's the case, then what we know is that a standard score lets us make comparisons. So if I walk into the meeting and use a different unit of measurement from my teacher or my SLP, we can't really have a fruitful conversation. If on the other hand, I say, okay, we're all talking about this same scale, and I as a school psychologist measured their cognitive ability around here, and the teacher measured their math ability around here, we can now talk about strengths and weaknesses. We can now talk about, does their cognitive ability predict their math ability? And if not, what is that gap? And what's the severity of that gap? And that speaks to eligibility. So standard scores are not anything special. They're not any amazing mystical number. It's just an indicator of where a student falls when looking at the broad distribution of all of their similar age or grade peers. And it lets us all speak the same language. It lets us all have the same conversation around what each of our individual assessments yielded. You'll see down here that I say that it talks about relative standing. And that's really important to know about standard scores and percentile ranks, which we're about to talk about. You'll note that nowhere in here, when I talk about a standard score, have I mentioned how well a student can actually do math, for example. What a standard score gives me is just, do the vast majority of their peers do this better than them, or worse than them, or kind of similar to them? If I pick a leaf off my tree and it's the same distance as the vast majority of all the other leaves on the tree, I'd probably get a standard score of 100 in leaf size. Um, and it would tell me that about half the leaves on that tree are the same size or smaller, and about half the leaves on that tree are bigger. That's all it tells me. It doesn't actually, as saying my leaf is a standard score of 100, it doesn't tell me how long my leaf is. It just says where it falls relative to all of its peers, in this case, other leaves on the tree. I'm gonna really beat this analogy as, as far as I can go with it. So let's talk about percentile ranks. Percentile ranks are a very similar thing. They are also relative standing. They, with some rounding error, are a one-to-one -one correlation. If I get a standard score of 100, I get a percentile rank of 50, plus or minus one or so, depending on how it's calculated. Um, so these things go together. And the percentile rank description that we've all heard and have probably used ourselves is this. If I took a representative sample of 100 children, the same age or grade as yours, and I lined them up based on their math ability, from the least math ability to the most math ability, 
if your student, let's say, is at the 16th percentile, it means that in that line of kids, your kid is number 16. So the rest of the students, uh, the students below 16, can do math. Uh, they, they, your student can do math as well or better than 16% of the other students. And the other half, 84% of students, your student's age, can do math better than them. Again, still don't know how well you can do math. I just know that the vast majority of students your age can do it better than you. So this is another measure of relative standing. I want to touch very briefly on average, and we're going to talk about this a little bit later if we have time. And that is the average range when we're talking about standard scores and percentile ranks simply means the middle, where the vast majority of similar scores lie, where all of my leaves that are very similar in size, that's what the average range means. For the Woodcock-Johnson, Bateria, Woodcock-Munoz Language Survey, the assessments that we're using today, the average range is defined as a standard score between 90 and 110. And when I'm in that average range, it means I am similar to the vast majority of other people, my age or grade, in my ability on this. I do want to make very clear, though, that average does not necessarily imply that your students at grade level, they're meeting grade standard, they're meeting expectations. Those things are measured in different ways. If you want to know your student's grade level, you use curriculum-based measurement. If you want to know if you're meeting expectations, you look at your district's grade expectations. The WJA doesn't know what grade levels are because curriculums are different all throughout the country. The WJA doesn't know what the, expect, the grade level expectations are at your particular school for any particular grade. So the WJA can tell you broadly compared to other students collected from across the country, is your student statistically typical or atypical? Either end is atypical, the further away you get from the middle. Um, but that's all, that's all that it's telling you. So be careful not to imply, you know, student fell in the average range, therefore is meeting expectations based on their grade. Well, they might be, they probably are, but the WJ alone doesn't tell you that. So we've talked a lot about how standard scores and percentile ranks, while helpful and while the basis upon which we use for a lot of our eligibility determinations, right? When we're considering a kid's eligibility, we're often looking at what is that gap between what we call their potential, their cognitive ability, and how they're currently performing. Are there specific areas of deficit that can explain that weakness um, if we're using a patterns of strengths and weaknesses model, et cetera? So that's, that's a big part of our eligibility piece is thinking about relative standing because federal and state regulations for special education don't say you get special education if you would benefit from it because then we would serve every kid in the school. Federal and uh, state regulations say you get special education support if, you, if your ability hangs out down here. And so we need to know where you fall in order to help make those determinations. But once we've made that determination, or maybe as a factor within that determination, it would also be really helpful to know how well the kid can actually do math. Sometimes we pull out our normal curve and we talk to a parent and we say, all right, your kid can, can do math here, you know, draw the little line of where they fall. And the parent's response is, okay, that's cool, but what is that, like, can they do math? Can they not do math? I don't know what that means. A score unique to the Woodcock-Johnson and those family of assessments is the relative proficiency index. And this is a score that doesn't speak just to relative standing. When we line up kids, what number in line are you? But it speaks to what's your proficiency? How well can you do this? So we're gonna spend a few minutes talking about that. Um, I'm gonna define it, and then I'm gonna give some examples that hopefully will make it more clear. So if the definition isn't immediately clear, hang with me and we'll get there. So the relative proficiency index reflects a student's proficiency on tasks that would be typically performed with 90% proficiency at that age or grade. And we're going to break down what that means. And it gives us a statement of likely success for similar tasks. So let me give you an example. This is the best way to explain this is with an example. So I'm working with Maria and we're doing an applied math problem, uh, applied math test. And Maria gets an RPI of 34 over 90, a relative proficiency index of 34 over 90. 
the way that I would explain that is if I took these applied math questions and I found, remember our normal curve? I found the kid that is Maria's age that is smack dab in the middle. I pick the kid that's exactly a 100. I give them these applied math problems and I figure out which problems they would get a 90% on. We use 90% because that's a common threshold for proficiency or mastery. When the kids hit 90, we generally say that you've demonstrated proficiency on this. So the set of questions that the most statistically typical kid would get a 90% on, I'm gonna give those exact same questions to Maria and she's gonna get a 34% on them. And that really tells me something, right? I can imagine, okay, the most statistically typical, let's say Maria's nine, the most statistically typical nine-year-old, I give them applied math and they can get a 90%. They can demonstrate mastery on this skill. And I give that exact same test to Maria and she can do just a little bit over a third of what they were able to do. I can immediately imagine what that looks like in the classroom, what that looks like in practice. This gives me a lot more than just knowing standard score of 85, for example. So the relative proficiency index is a criterion reference statement about the individual's functionality or quality of performance. How well can you actually do the task? The scores range from zero over 90 to 100 over 90. So the denominator is always 90 because we're comparing them to another student, the most typical peer, their age or grade, who could complete the task and where the items on which they would get a 90%. So when an average peer would get a 90% on this task, would demonstrate proficiency on this task, how well would your student do? And that can range from zero to 100. Here's another example. If I did a spelling task and my student got a 45 over 90 RPI, that would tell me that when an average peer would complete the spelling task and get 90% of the words right, my student would do that exact same list and get 45% of the words right. Because this is based on a ordinal, or not an ordinal scale, but an equal interval scale, I can actually say my student is about half as proficient uh, as his typical peers. In this conversation, when I talk about the relative proficiency index, I'm gonna use the terms proficiency, success, and accuracy pretty interchangeably. My student would have 45% success on a task that a typical peer would complete with 90% accuracy. That these are all acceptable ways to say it. A couple more examples and then I'm gonna give you an analogy. So I'm working with Yoshi, we're doing writing. He gets an RPI of 23 over, over 90. I would say that when a typical peer, Yoshi's age, would complete a writing task with 90% accuracy or success, Yoshi would be able to complete that same task and would attain 23% success. So we can really imagine that gap. Bennett, on the other hand, he's actually working ahead of his peers. So when Bennett does math reasoning and we give him the questions that a typical peer would get a 90% on, Bennett would get a 98% on. I actually know that he's probably ready to move on to the next grouping, the next stage, whatever it might be. We can really see how relevant this would be to having conversations around placement and intervention based on their proficiency level. So the best analogy for the relative proficiency index, Snellen index. And the Snellen index is what we use to describe visual acuity. When I say I have 2040 vision, that's the Snellen index. And what that means is that what an average person can see at 40 feet is what I can see at 20 feet. So my vision is not as good. Um, as, as a typical person. And what we know about vision specifically, this is kind of the depressing slide, I apologize. What we know about vision is that it changes over the lifespan, right? As we age, our body decays. I'm sorry, this is depressing. Um, and what is typical, what is average vision changes based on how old you are. So the fact that I have a 2040 vision at my age is less atypical than it was, you know, when I was 15. So let's say that Joe is 65. He's going into the DMV to renew his driver's license. And the person behind the counter says, I need to know how well you can see 
So I need to know whether you need the little sticker or indicator on your driver's license that says you need to wear your glasses when you drive. If Joe's response to that person was, oh, my vision is at the 40th percentile. So the person behind the counter now knows if they understand statistics that Joe can see as well or better than 40% of other 65 year olds. But how well does that let her know whether Joe can see something running out in front of his vehicle? If she has this chart, she could kind of figure out, okay, 65, 40th percentile, what does that mean? But in and of itself, relative standing in this case, knowing where you fall compared to your peers actually doesn't help me very much. What I need Joe to say is, I have 2100 vision. And the person behind the counter says, you should please wear glasses when you drive. So this is more of a very clear, what is your proficiency? How well can you see? This top number lets us know where he falls compared to his peers, but the bottom number says, how well can you do the task? Which in this case is very important. In the same way, if we're in an evaluation meeting and we're talking about Jane and we say that she has a standard score of 79, which puts her at the eighth percentile rank, this is really important for eligibility for all the reasons that we just discussed. This is kind of the foundation of eligibility decisions in a lot of models. But then if we move on from eligibility and want to talk about groupings, placements, interventions, what are we going to do with Jane and how can we support her? It is really a lot more instructionally relevant to say when a typical peer would be able to complete this task at 90% proficiency, Jane would only demonstrate 25% proficiency. I can really imagine what intervention or grouping is more important to her based on understanding her proficiency level. So one more thing on this topic, and then we're gonna zoom out of RPI a little bit. Sometimes we put our RPI and our standard score right next to each other, and they seem at first glance to make no sense. Let's talk about that for a second, because I don't want to loose you into the world to start looking at RPIs and be like, but wait. So let's look at this score. This is a set of scores where the student's RPI is not half bad. A typical peer would get a 90%. My kid's getting an 83. That's a B. I'm okay with that. I'm not too concerned. But their standard score, boy, howdy, we're uh, special education eligibility, right? We're two standard deviations below the mean. For a lot of children, this is an appropriate indicator that they would need some special education support. Or sometimes it's flipped. Sometimes it works the other way. I get a standard score that's like, meh, mid 80s, should we exit them? They seem to be doing okay, this isn't terrible. But I get an RPI score that's a lot more concerning. A typical peer would be able to do this with 90% proficiency and my student can only do two thirds of that. I'm concerned about that gap. So why does this happen? It happens for a lot of different reasons. One is that scores are derived differently. The standard score and the percentile rank are built on a standard deviation and the RPI isn't. A reason that explains a lot of this though and the one that I wanna talk about a little bit is that abilities develop differently over the lifespan. So this is a cross-section of WJ4 cognitive scores over the lifespan. These charts can be found for each of the batteries in the technical manual, which can be downloaded from the resources tab. So let me orient you to this chart. So this is age in years. This is ability level measured by the W score. We're gonna take a minute to collectively agree that we don't wanna think about this side of the chart because the angle of the lines is not something that we wanna think about right now. And we're gonna focus on this part where things are growing and exciting and happy, right? What we see on this chart when we focus on these different growth curves is we can see that depending on the skill that we're talking about, the slope of this line actually varies quite a bit. I can see that when I'm talking about long-term retrieval, I'm talking about a skill that is more or less in place by age 12-ish and doesn't really change much over the lifespan. It's pretty steady. Whereas we talk about cognitive processing speed and I'm talking about a skill that's growing rapidly until what, my early 20s when my frontal lobe stops developing and then it does depressing things that we're not gonna talk about. Um, so the slope of this line, how quickly a skill is growing, can actually be a really good explanation for these differences in RPI scores and standard scores. Uh, and let me talk about why. So let's go back to this kid. This was the kid that had an RPI score 
that we weren't that concerned about. He had a small performance gap, but his standard score when compared to other kids his age seemed very alarming. Let's say that this set of skill, this set of scores came from a 13 year old student who was doing word attack. If you're not familiar with word attack, it's on the WJ achievement. It's a pseudo word reading task that is a good measurement of phonics. For most students, phonics are in place by third grade and doesn't change much over the lifespan. This is a growth curve that is very flat. So what this means is that to be even a little bit bad at phonics, obviously I wouldn't use that language with a parent, but to have a small skill deficit between us, let's say you're a little bit bad at word attack at 13, that is statistically very atypical. So when we look at a relative standing, a normal curve, you're gonna be quite low. Oh my goodness, almost all of your peers can do phonics better than you. That's true. But in reality, the number of skills, if I were to make a list of the phonics skills you're missing, it would be fairly short. Now, the brevity of that list does not imply it will be easy to teach them to you because you've made it to 13 and haven't learned them. So there's likely a learning disability happening that's in interfering with your ability to learn these tasks. But the performance gap, the skill gap, the proficiency gap is actually fairly small. So this happens a lot on abilities that are acquired early in life and don't change much over time. They're pretty flat. Another way of thinking about it is they have a very narrow standard deviation. All their uh, normal curve is very pointy. Almost everyone is right here in the middle and there's not a lot of variance. So now let's talk about this other kid. And let's say that we're talking about the same 13 year old, but we're talking about math calculation. Imagine for me what the math calculation growth curve looks like, especially at 13, basically straight up and down with math calc. As soon as we teach them something new, we teach them something else. Like it shoots up. They're learning so much. So what this set of scores tells me is that they do have a fairly significant performance gap, proficiency gap from an average peer. But that's not that atypical for their age. So this is a skill that's, the growth curve is basically straight up and down. It's statistically kind of normal to not be very good at math calculation when you're 13. Another way of thinking about it is your normal curve is super wide. There's a ton of variation. 13 year olds doing math vary a lot in their ability. So you can hang out anywhere in that middle and look relatively kind of okay, even if you're missing a lot. This does not mean that this kid is not frustrated. Their parents aren't frustrated. Their teacher are frustrated. This is that student where you sit in your meeting and you say, oh, the student on math calculation got a standard score of 86, which puts them in the low average range. And the math teacher's jaw hits the table and says, what do you mean low average? They're struggling so much. That doesn't describe my kid and 86 doesn't describe my kid. What are you talking about? This is where sometimes we can look at the RPI and say, oh, wow. Yeah, you're right. There's a big proficiency gap here. He has two thirds of the proficiency as an average peer. And that's pretty concerning. It just isn't reflected in the standard score because it's, a, it's an ability that ranges so much based on the student's age. So one of the handouts that we included in the side panel over here is an RPI interpretation chart. It's a score interpretation chart that includes an RPI chart here. Um, I kind of have a slightly visually different one, but it uh, gives you the same information. So if I was working with a student and received an RPI score of let's say 60 over 90, I could describe that student's performance as having limited proficiency. And I could say in my evaluation report that if I gave them age level or grade level tasks, they would find them very difficult. So the RPI can be helpful throughout your evaluation process if you have a lot of professional, develop, uh, professional judgment uh, to be able to say whether or not a student qualifies. Sometimes that kid whose standard scores look like, oh, maybe we need to exit him, but all of their teachers are saying, we can't exit them, like they really need support. Um, sometimes your RPI can get you over that hump if you're allowed to use that as part of your eligibility determination. And that'll depend based on your district. But also be sure to look at your RPI when you're thinking about placement, intervention groups, kind of where we want the kid to be. Grouping our children in intervention groups based on their RPI scores would actually be one of the best ways to do it uh, versus a standard score 
All right, so I'm going to speak very briefly about age and grade equivalent. This is a much larger topic than we have time for in our few minutes, but I do want to address it because I said I would mention it later. And then I'm going to skip a few slides and we're going to um, go to one last topic. Um, it, again, if you're having questions, please uh, be entering those into the chat. And I might go over time just a little bit to answer some of those questions if they're not all being answered. Um, but yeah, hang with me here. So when we talk about age and grade equivalent, I'm going to talk about grade equivalent because that's the one that we find used most often, but age works the same way. I personally, me and my practice, choose not to use grade equivalent when I'm reporting on student scores, and that's because they are very commonly misunderstood. Uh, your choice is totally yours. If your district or organization tells you to use it or not use it, please follow their guidance. Um, but be aware that this is the most commonly misunderstood score on your report. So what a grade equivalent does is it reflects the examinee's performance in terms of the grade level in the norming sample at which the average score was the same as your student's score. And let me break that down and make it a little bit more understandable. So if when I look at, so, so we collected data, right, from 7,416 people to get our norm data for the WJ4. And if I'm working with a student that's in the second grade, six month, and I'm, uh, and I pull, so what the, sorry, what the online scoring system does when you're scoring this is we pull out all the other second grade six month students, right? And we're making that comparison if that's the, the norm group that we're using. We're making that comparison. And if what we see is that when I look at all the second grade six month students in that whole big norm sample, and I see that on this test, let's say we're talking about letter word identification, the most average score, the most typical score is a raw score of 14. They get 14 points right. What that means is that any person who does letter word identification and gets 14 points right gets a 2.6 as their grade equivalent score. Let me restate that again. 2.6 means that your student is performing the same as the average student in the second grade six months from the norm sample. What do people assume it means? Your kid's reading at the mid-second grade level. That is um, automatically what parents assume, what teachers assume, what I assumed at certain points of my career. That's the absolute first assumption. Here's the problem. The definition of mid-second grade level reading varies by curriculum, and the WJ doesn't know curriculum. The WJ is curriculum agnostic. It is a test that is used throughout the whole country and is based on data collected throughout the whole country because it isn't tied to a grade level. So if your second grade reading looks different than the second grade reading a few states away from you, the WJ can't speak to second grade reading. What a grade equivalent of 2.6 actually means is on reading task, your student is performing the same as an average student from the norm sample who was in the second grade six months. I don't find this description as useful for parents and the fact that they will just assume that it means this means that I choose not to use it. If you use it, please make sure that you're using it correctly. Please make sure that you're describing it in this way. Please remove, when I hand out this slide in person, I say put a big X to this slide. Please remove this sentence from your evaluation reports. According to the WJ4, student is performing at the blank grade level. WJ can't tell you about grade levels. They can tell you about grade equivalents, whether your kid was the same as that, those graded kids in the norm sample, but grade level is a local thing, and the WJ can't speak to grade level. So just be careful with it and make sure that um, you're describing it appropriately. So the last thing that I want to talk about very briefly, and then I'm going to chime in with any questions, and if those of you that need to go on time, please feel free to. I want to think about qualitative data because the testing session that we have with this kid gives us more than just numbers. It can give us a lot of information, especially those of us that are school psychologists and diagnosticians that may not see this kid day in and day out in the classroom. We can get a lot of information from this assessment. So qualitative data is obtained throughout the behavior, sorry, it's obtained through observing the behavior observations throughout our testing session, right? And by looking at the individual items and doing an error analysis. And it gives us context for the student's performance. We can describe 
the examinee's reaction to the test situation. Uh, I noticed when doing math problems, the kid was counting on their fingers underneath the table. That's a good thing to know about this kid. It doesn't, that has nothing to do with their scores. When I asked the student to do spelling, they broke their pencil in half and said, I hate spelling. I would hope I could share that with the teacher before I sent them into a classroom. And it gives us the ability to look at specific skills when we look at the item level. So I can look through all the items that they got right or wrong, and I might be able to notice, oh, when they're asked to do a vowel blend or when they're asked to do two-digit multiplication, they're unable to do it. That's a trend. We have a few methods of collecting quantitative, or sorry, qualitative data. Um, that should say qualitative data. Um, we can do the rating scales on the fronts of the protocols. These questions, where did my protocol go? These questions, the test session observation checklist, gives us the top seven uh, areas that are predictive of success in the schools, and we can rate the child's performance on those. Also, if for the WJ achievement specifically in the standard battery, we have a qualitative observations checkmark box that um, if we're doing the achievement, we should be filling this out. If we're having someone else do the achievement for it, we should be asking them for this data. And then, like I was saying, we can also do a an item level analysis. And this qualitative data is really useful. It gives me an appreciation of the behavior that underlined the, uh, the test scores that I got. It helps me predict the examinee's behavior in an instructional situation. Like I said, if this kid breaks his pencil every time he's asked to do spelling, I wanna share that information with people that might ask him to do spelling in the future so we can come up with a plan to support him. Uh, it can help us give instructional recommendations around specific skills and can just let us have those anecdotal stories when we're talking with the parent in the evaluation meeting, which can sometimes feel so negative and so focused on the student's weaknesses. Doesn't it feel great to have the opportunity to say, can we just pause for a second? Because I really want to show you, we did this writing task with, and I love their response. Can I just show you what that was for a second? Those moments are sometimes the most important moments in our evaluation meetings. So this is an example. I'm gonna read this for you really quickly and then we're gonna open it up for questions. And I want you to think about when you, when I read this to you, how much you can imagine this kid already in your head and note that I have given you no information about their scores. It says, when presented with a mathematics related task, Mateo became visibly agitated as evidenced by moving frequently in his seat, looking at the clock and asking, are we done yet? Mateo was observed to use his fingers to count when adding or subtracting single digit numbers. He attempted three out of three items requiring two digit addition or subtraction, but was unable to answer any of those items correctly. So this contextual information that I got just from engaging with Mateo during our testing session told me a lot about how he engages with math, how he probably feels about math, and really helps inform the math scores that I got. You probably have a pretty good image of Mateo in your head right now, and you know nothing about what his standard score was. So don't forget that this is another source of data that you can get um, as part of your evaluation time that's just as valuable as everything else that you're getting. We only have a few minutes left, but I did want to address a question that I see has come in a few times, and that's whether other standardized assessments offer a relative proficiency index score. We certainly hope that we'll see more of this in the future across other assessments, but for now, the primary place that you will find a proficiency score is on the WJ family of assessments. So you can uh, receive a RPI score on all WJ tests, the Bateria, the Woodcock Munoz Language Survey. In fact, it's very important on the Woodcock Munoz Language Survey, right? Because when we're measuring language, we often think about it in terms of proficiency. Uh, you can also get a proficiency score on the new Battelle Developmental Inventory, the third edition. On this test, it's called the Relative Developmental Index, but it's built the same way as the RPI. All right, that's all the time that we have today. If you have any other questions, please contact webinars at riversideinsights.com. Before we go, I did wanna share a few more resources with you. If you found this session helpful today, there are a few more webinar recordings that you might find useful. You can find the list of all the available webinar recordings that we offer at info.riversideinsights.com slash clinical PD, like professional development. 
And I would like to call your attention specifically to the assessment foundation section of this page, which you can find near the bottom. And there's two particular sessions that I recommend. One is called Riverside Score, the ins and outs of electronic record forms. And this is a brief overview of the Riverside Score online scoring platform. So if you've ever wondered how scoring licenses are added to your account and when in the scoring process they're marked as used and how to make sure that's all done correctly, this video is for you. The second session that I really wanna recommend is called a refresher on basils, ceilings, and the complete page rule. And this is a 45 minute session that gives you an overview of all the different types of basal and ceiling rules present on the Woodcock Johnson family of assessments, including the one that's unique to our tests called test by complete pages. And this test by complete pages rule is the number one most common administration error on the WJ. So I definitely recommend checking that out and sharing with any colleagues that might use these tests as well. And again, you can find both of those in the assessment foundations portion at the clinical PD uh, page that you can see the address on your screen. So thanks again for your time today. I really appreciate it and I hope you have a great week.